History and biography demand a certain level of simplicity in storytelling, but Richard Nixon continues to defy any such efforts. Few modern presidents have divided America as did Richard Nixon. To his still large number of supporters, he was a visionary who kept America the leader of the world, even as he used his remarkable grasp of international affairs to help keep the world at peace. But his legions of detractors can never forgive his greatest claim to fame as the only president in American history to resign in disgrace. It has been more than 20 years since Watergate, and yet Richard Nixon remains a compelling figure of our national past. As far as I'm concerned, we've just begun to fight. Beware of one-liners when people tell you about Richard Nixon. Uh, 50 lines about Richard Nixon are probably not enough. He would uh, not hesitate to do whatever he felt he could do and could get away with that would help him to win, whatever the ethics of the situation. The ethic of the situation was win. In, in that sense, he was the quintessential American. Winning is everything. We didn't make it up. The press didn't make it up. It happened. And this great conspiracy existed. And uh, 32 people were going to go to jail for it. He was a conspiracy buff. And he liked intrigue. And he liked secret maneuverings of the FBI. He liked to hear about what the CIA did and so on. He just couldn't leave that stuff alone. The Nixon administration, with all its mistakes, did some wonderful things, started some wonderful things. And Nixon as a man, I think, uh, redeemed himself at the end. He was a very hard-driving, brilliant, a demanding, visionary kind of leader. And when he was bad, he was really bad. And when he was good, he was great. Southern California, just entering the 20th century, a land where citrus fruit was the new gold. History and biography demand a certain level of simplicity in storytelling, but Richard Nixon continues to defy any such efforts. Few modern presidents have divided America as did Richard Nixon. To his still large number of supporters, he was a visionary who kept America the leader of the world, even as he used his remarkable grasp of international affairs to help keep the world at peace. But his legions of detractors can never forgive his greatest claim to fame as the only president in American history to resign in disgrace. It has been more than 20 years since Watergate, and yet Richard Nixon remains a compelling figure of our national past. As far as I'm concerned, we've just begun to fight. Beware of one-liners when people tell you about Richard Nixon. Uh, 50 lines about Richard Nixon are probably not enough. He would uh, not hesitate to do whatever he felt he could do and could get away with it would help him to win, whatever the ethics of the situation. The ethic of the situation was win. In, in that sense, he was the quintessential American. Winning is everything. We didn't make it up press didn't make it up. It happened. And this great conspiracy existed. And uh, 32 people were going to go to jail for it. He was a conspiracy buff. And he liked intrigue. And he liked secret maneuverings of the FBI. And he liked to hear about what the CIA did and so on. He just couldn't leave that stuff alone. Nixon administration, with all its mistakes, did some wonderful things, started some wonderful things. And Nixon, as a man, I think, uh, redeemed himself at the end. He was a very hard-driving, brilliant, uh, demanding, visionary kind of leader. 
And when he was bad, he was really bad. And when he was good, he was great. Southern California, just entering the 20th century, a land where citrus fruit was the new gold, mined by thousands of farmers who'd migrated from the Midwest to seek their fortunes in the California sun. It was here in 1913 in the tiny town of Yorba Linda that Richard Nixon was born. His father had tried citrus farming, and the family was now facing one of its hard realities. The year that Dick was born, January of 1913, it was about the coldest winter they'd ever had, so they just about lost everything. The small house Richard was born in and where he spent his first six years was from a Sears Roebuck kit. It was built by his father, Frank Nixon. He was a man of many skills who'd mastered a number of trades. My father always said, anything any other man can do, I can do. I may not do it as well, but I can do it if I must. He was also full of fun, but quick to anger. Although he was sometimes uh, described as too rough, too tough, sometimes described as being mean. He was not, and a heart of gold, and he, was, uh, he wouldn't uh, turn down charity for anybody who needed it, but he refused to accept it for himself. And that's what made him tick. In 1908, in Whittier, California, the irrepressible Frank Nixon married the considerably more genteel Hannah Milhouse. Well, Mrs. Nixon was a kind of a saintly woman, a very gentle woman, very um, modest. She was uh, the confessor. People would come and tell her everything in the world, and uh, she, it was private. She kept it. Hannah Milhouse was a strictly observant Quaker who had come west from Indiana as a young girl along with the rest of the Milhouse family. Whittier had become a center of Quakerism in California, and the Millhouses were soon one of the leading families in town. Richard Nixon spent his first years in Yorba Linda. By 1918, the Nixons had grown to include three boys. Richard had an older brother, Harold, and a younger brother, Donald. They were a st strong moral family. They went to church every Sunday, and uh, Hannah was a very religious uh, person. In fact, they went to church four times on Sunday, but out of church, they shared the Western Quaker trait of debating with neighbors and each other the politics of the day. It was the way Richard Nixon first gained an interest in the wider world. When Richard was nine, the family moved the short distance from Yorba Linda back to Whittier, by now a large town, but one where everybody still knew everybody else. There was quite a bit of money in town. Uh, Dick didn't have any of it, but uh, the, uh, between the oil man and the people in the ranching business, it was a very successful little isolated community. You have to think back 60 years or more, <laughs> but from Painter Avenue almost to Fullerton, it was solid orange grove and no business at all except the Nixon country store with a little service station. In Whittier, Richard Nixon lived a life filled with the diversions of small-town America. And as he'd later explain, the distant whistle of trains set him dreaming of becoming a railroad engineer. As in so many families at the time, the tragedy of an early death struck the Nixon family when Richard was 12. Another Nixon son, Arthur, had been born in 1918, but as a young child, he contracted tuberculosis. He died at the age of seven in 1925. Arthur's loss struck Richard and the family deeply. Hannah would later report that Richard took from the loss a determination to replace his parents' pain with pride in his own success. Frank Nixon saw Arthur's death as an admonition from God. He never again opened his store on Sunday. Working at the store took up much of the teenaged Richard Nixon's time. Setting up the fruits and vegetables, driving into Los Angeles at four in the morning to go to the farmer's market to pick up the produce, getting the produce back, getting it on the shelves. He was very good at it. Uh, he could really fluff up that lettuce and, and make it really look nice and get the, and 
the carrots and the potatoes and the beets and what have you. And then he'd be off to school, and then he would do his homework and work in the store of the afternoon, late afternoon, and get about four hours sleep a night, and get up at four o'clock in the morning and drive back into Los Angeles to get that day's produce. At Whittier High School, Richard showed himself to be an exceptionally bright student and hard worker who excelled at everything he did, and he did just about everything. Because every organization that Nixon joined, and he joined everyone that was available, he eventually became president of it. So he obviously had, if not necessarily a following, he certainly had respect of people. How, how popular he was is another matter. I think people reacted to him by feeling there's an absence of spontaneity here. This is contrived on his part. All this phrenic activity that he's involved in is not spontaneous. And, and so the genuine friendships came very hard for Dick Nixon. In fact, almost impossible. Well, I had just thought of him as a very serious person. Uh, he wasn't one of the hail fellows well met or <laughs> standing around on campus looking for something to do. He uh, was focused, knew what he was doing. He knew what he wanted. During his teenage years, another tragedy struck the family. Richard's older brother, Harold, as friendly, outgoing, and popular as Richard was shy and introverted, contracted tuberculosis. When Harold needed further care, Hannah Nixon took him to Arizona for its clean, dry air. For the next two years, she tended him and other TB patients there. But his mother's long absences from home tending Harold were very hard emotionally and financially on the Nixons. Richard graduated the best all-round student at Whittier High and was given a scholarship to Harvard. But Harold's illnesses had stressed the family's finances to the breaking point. He had no choice. He'd have to stay at home. Richard's dream of going to college in the East was now dashed. It was a tuition scholarship, but he couldn't afford the room and board out there. That's how poor this family was. Uh, she never, uh, Hannah Nixon never had a new dress in all the years that Nixon was growing up. Uh, they never went to a restaurant to eat. Nixon lived in sight of the mountains and uh, didn't have any way to get up to them. Uh, this, this was not a rock-bottom, poverty-stricken family. But this was a family in which they ate a hell of a lot more cornbread than not. Turning down Harvard was one of the hardest blows the young Richard had yet to face. In the fall of 1930, he entered Whittier College. Again, he excelled at his studies and joined everything, including the football. But his modest size, less than commanding physical skills, and above all, remarkable will, made him most useful as a stand-in for the opposing team. <laughs> it just breaks your heart to do it, but uh, it didn't matter how hard you hit Dick Nixon. He was right in there scrapping you like he <laughs> was going to make a touchdown or something. Natural sociability may not have been Richard Nixon's strong suit, but he knew what appealed to his peers, and he won the student body presidency on a promise to allow student dancing on this very Quaker campus. At Whittier, Richard Nixon felt a kinship with other hard-working boys like himself. The sons of the more prosperous local families had long joined a college society called the Franklins. Nixon now helped organize the Orthogonians, an intentionally more informal society of the diligent have-nots. The easy success of the privileged, he'd continue to resent it for the rest of his life. I think he had a kind of a, an inner feeling somehow, which he expressed many times, that many people who had not worked as hard as he did and who were not as serious as he were had got ahead more easily. And so, and I think he had a, a kind of a built-in antagonism towards that uh, kind of person. In Richard's third year of college, Harold died from the tuberculosis. Just before his death, he had returned to Whittier and for his mother's birthday asked Richard to drive him to town to buy her a mixer. So he, um, they brought it home and the next morning, my mother's birthday, uh, Harold was determined to get up and uh, <clears throat> give her the mixer. And, um, and he died in her arms right there. Dick couldn't talk about that anymore. 
The family was devastated by the loss. According to his mother, Hannah, Richard sank into a deep, impenetrable silence. And from then on, he tried to be three sons in one. In fact, the perfect son to ease his parents' loss. In June of 1934, Richard Nixon graduated from Whittier, a four-year honor student. He applied for and received a scholarship to Duke University Law School. The competition here was much tougher than any he'd faced before, but his drive propelled him to third in his class. Richard Nixon was 24 now, with his future course unset. He knew a life in politics appealed to him. He'd been a master politician since high school, but he didn't know how to go about it. One alternate path he tried would have changed his future dramatically. He attempted to join the FBI, but he never heard back and assumed he'd been turned down. Until many years later, when J. Edgar Hoover investigated and discovered that the position had been eliminated at the time. Richard Nixon, armed with a succession of academic accomplishments and honors, was lost. No big city law firms clamored for his services, and he had no group of close friends he was determined to follow. So, Richard Nixon would make as his next step forward a return back to where he started. Whittier, California. 24-year-old Richard Nixon returned here in 1937, fresh out of law school to join the small firm of Wingert and Bewley. Now he began the life of a local attorney. According to the woman he'd one day marry, he was also the eligible new young man in town. I asked her, you know, what was, what was Daddy like? And she said, oh, he was the darling bachelor around town. All the mothers were getting in the act and asking him to dinner. I mean, he was, a, he was a president of the, the Kiwanis and the 2030 Club, and uh, he was making a name. He was a deputy city attorney, so he was considered a prize in Whittier. For pleasure, he joined the local theater group, where he met a popular young teacher, as hardworking as he was, Thelma Pat Ryan. He was taken with Pat immediately and made an uncharacteristically brash move. He proposed the first night he met her. And he's, he's a shy, sensitive person, not usually impulsive, but he told her after they'd met at tryouts for a little theater play, he said, you may not believe this, but I'm going to marry you someday. They began to see each other, but Pat was reluctant to let her wittier students see this part of her private life. They would most often go to the beach or leave the town because she's a fiercely independent and she didn't want anyone watching what she was doing. Outings often included Richard's younger brother, Ed. When I met Pat, I was really taken by this exuberant school teacher with the flaming red hair and, uh, and legs that could make her run faster than I could. And, you know, here I was, nine years old or so, and uh, she could outrun me and I thought I was pretty fast. Well, they went to the beach and to the mountains and places, and occasionally they'd take me along. <laughs> and Pat was a real buddy. During the courtship, Richard Nixon wrote to Pat. When the winds, winds blow and the rains fall and the sun shines through the clouds, as it is now, I still resolve, as I did then, that nothing so fine ever happened to me or anyone else as falling in love with thee, my dearest heart. On the 21st of June, 1940, Richard Nixon's earlier certainty came true. He and Pat Ryan were married at the Mission Inn in Riverside, California. And now it was time to take the steps that would bring Richard Nixon closer to politics. In early 1942, with America at war, he and Pat moved to Washington, where he got a job with the Office of Price Administration. It was Richard Nixon's first taste of bureaucratic Washington, and the OPA was stifling to him. As a Quaker, and also as a government employee, Richard Nixon could have refused war service. As a future politician, no such option was available. He knew this war had to be fought, and so he joined the Navy in 1942. Nixon's decision was painful to his mother. Besides the real danger he would face, he'd be leaving the Quaker path of pacifism. My mother's view of that was, I wish he didn't have to go but understand that he's made the decision and that's as it should be. Because free will is the basic tenet of Quakerism. You have to decide yourself, make your own commitment, and then carry through. He entered the Navy as a Lieutenant Junior Grade and opted for sea duty a few months later. 
Nixon became a supply officer in the South Pacific. When new shipments would come in, he'd manage to get and distribute meat and beer to the very appreciative men at what became known as Nick's Hamburger Stand. It was a period that changed him forever. In the Navy, Richard Nixon got to know his fellow Americans in a way that he had not previously. He had been a college student and then a, a small-town lawyer. And that was a, a, a very good and very broadening experience for Nixon. And he did a good job as an officer leading this small supply detachment. It was also in the Navy that Richard Nixon learned a skill quite out of keeping with his past, poker. And he became very good at poker, a very disciplined poker player, and a great bluffer. We have an account of his uh, looking into a pair of aces up. He had a pair of deuces up, and he bluffed the aces out of a big pot. He came home with 10,000 bucks, and he used that money to finance his first political campaign. Richard Nixon stayed with the Navy doing expert legal work at the war's end. B.J. Day found him and thousands of others in Times Square in New York City. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. He was still in the East when he received a call later that year from Whittier asking if he wanted to become the Republican candidate for Congress from the 12th District. The caller was a local banker, Herman Perry. My father was a frustrated uh, politician. He, he, could, he couldn't run for anything because he was working for a bank. He took out his uh, dreams and Dick Nixon. He looked upon Dick Nixon as an adopted son. He saw in Dick Nixon uh, a young fellow who, with a war record, just coming back from the service, would look would look good politically, and uh, they uh, got behind him. Nixon's backers in Whittier wanted to oust the district's five-term congressman, Jerry Voorhees. Voorhees was the perfect representative of the New Deal and all its government programs, anathema to many of the small businessmen of Southern California. I'd suggest that he contact his service. Much of every congressman's day is taken up by the visits of lobbyists and constituents. Since one of the Voorhees was not a sitting duck. He was a well-respected politician who could serve as a model for the role of congressman. Most important and most demanding of his duties is committee work. He had become fairly popular, Voorhees had, and he was... Pretty well respected in Congress as a hard worker, maybe a little too far to the left for most of the congressmen, but a hard worker and an honest guy. And he looked pretty secure in 1946. It, it took um, considerable just uh, plain guts for Nixon to stake his poker winnings and a year of his life on trying to unseat Gary Voorhees. The 1946 campaign was a rock'em sock'em battle in which Richard Nixon used the fear of communism to bury his opponent. It was a technique that Republicans had already used with some success. When he was selected to run by his hometown people to run for Congress in 1946, uh, the Republican Party was already very definitely on an anti-red campaign and finding that that was political profitable. But Richard Nixon took the inference of communist sympathies to a new level. Nixon used fear and innuendo in the 1946 campaign by going after Voorhees, exposing his record and his way of putting it on this communism and government business and socialism taking over America and the New Deal leading us down the path to radicalism. Underneath. Yeah, people were afraid of that, and Nixon played very effectively on those fears. Namely, that all men are born equal. Basically, in that election, he accused Jerry Voorhees of being a communist. He knew that he had exaggerated the extent of Jerry Voorhees' uh, radicalism, but he felt it. He felt it very deeply. He felt that Jerry Voorhees really was dangerous to the American Republic. On election day, Richard Nixon won by a huge margin. In fact, it was a red-letter day for Republicans nationwide. The reaction to the New Deal had gained the party 56 seats in the House and 13 in the Senate. Richard Nixon never expressed any doubts about his tactics in the Voorhees race. A reporter who had, wasn't it a reporter who had challenged him on the Voorhees race and, and on his distortion of, of Voorhees' record, and Nixon said, well, of course I know that's true. <laughs> 
I, I, you don't understand. I had to win. Richard Nixon was on his way to Washington now, just another unknown congressman. That would change sooner than even he could have hoped. Nineteen forty-seven. This was a happy time for Richard and Pat Nixon. He was a new congressman from California with a first child, Patricia. She would be followed two years later by another daughter, Julie. Early in Richard Nixon's term in Congress, the staunch Republican surprised many by backing Democratic President Harry Truman's Marshall Plan, designed to rebuild post-war Europe and prevent its going communist. As the red tide rolled over Europe, the Truman answer was immediate. It was an important early foray into foreign affairs for Nixon. 1948 presidential election. Thomas e. In the summer of 1948, the Republicans expected to win back the White House from a very vulnerable Harry Truman. They attacked his response to communism abroad and charged he wasn't tough enough on communist sympathizers at home. They saw a government in Washington riddled with such sympathizers who were protected by the Democrats. In this atmosphere, Richard Nixon was appointed to a committee that was gaining increasing notice, HUAC, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. HUAC undertook investigations into alleged communist influence in some very public fields, like Hollywood. But it was the investigation of a high-ranking former State Department employee that would make Richard Nixon a name known nationwide. On the one side was the tough, self-made politician who shared America's hatred of communism and then wrote it to Washington. On the other side, accused of having been a communist, was Alger Hiss, the patrician and popular New Dealer, now head of a wealthy endowment. He really wanted to, to get Hiss. Now, I don't discount the fact that he no doubt believed Hiss was really guilty, but I think also the contrast in their backgrounds and their educations and so forth set Nixon's teeth on edge. Hiss was, was the model of of the New Dealer, the rich New York kid with a lot of brains who had thrown himself in on the side of the people and it, during the New Deal and during the, during the war. And Dick Nixon's the one who exposed him. Who's the Liar? Might well be the title of the drama which unfolds before a packed caucus room where the House Un-American Affairs Committee members swear in Alger Hiss, former State Department executive. Mr. Hiss is accused of being a former communist, and before news cameras faces his accuser. Mr. Hiss is lying. His accuser was a self-proclaimed ex-communist and now Time Magazine editor named Whitaker Chambers, who had none of the Hiss confidence in style. He seemed an unlikely friend of the elegant bureaucrat, who denied even knowing him. We were close friends. We are caught in the tragedy of history. And Nixon's most important role in his case was staying with it and staying at it. He was certain that Hiss was the one who was lying at a time when almost nobody else thought so. And he was under very great pressure from the big people in the Republican Party, including John Foster Dulles, who were calling him up and saying, you better back off on this one. And he didn't back off. November 1948. While the Hiss case continued, Democrat Harry Truman defeated Republican Tom Dewey for the presidency in a stunning upset. Suddenly, Nixon's pursuit of Hiss was in jeopardy. The Democrats might abolish HUAC or let the whole Hiss affair die. Then a bombshell hit. For the first time, Chambers accused Hiss of much more than communism. He accused him of being a spy and he guided investigators to microfilm hidden in pumpkins on his Maryland farm, microfilm of files he said were given to him by Hiss. The so-called pumpkin papers were copies of State Department documents from the 30s, many written on Hiss's typewriter and with his handwriting on them. Richard Nixon recognized instantly the irresistible appeal of this bizarre spy story. This microfilm was made for the purpose of transmitting these documents in reduced form to the Soviet Union. In one shot, Richard Nixon cemented his reputation as one of the nation's premier anti-communists, as he showed his great skill at capturing the public's attention. Hiss was found guilty in 1950 and sentenced to five years in prison. He would continue to declare his innocence forever after. The Hiss case made Richard Nixon's reputation 
one reason that it is still controversial. We tend now to look back at that case as an example of Nixon the opportunist uh, uh, getting a lot of publicity. The fact is he was an investigator doing a fair and honest job. It was not a hatchet job. It was not a uh, McCarthy hearing. It was a well-run hearing. And it made him, made his career. It, it's the defining moment in his early life. It's it turned a first term obscure California congressman who had used questionable tactics to win his seat into a national figure in his first term in Congress. In looking back at the Hiss case years later, Richard Nixon saw a double edge. He felt that the case put him on a path for national office, but he also felt it set liberals and the liberal press forever against him. As for Pat, she too would see the Hiss case as a turning point for her husband. It, it was a crack in, in her idealistic perception of politics. Uh, a lot of influential people in government and in the news media had supported his. They couldn't believe that he was a communist subversive. And when my father proved them wrong, there was a vindictiveness that went on for years. And uh, that was difficult. In any case, Richard Nixon now had a national reputation, and the ambitious young congressman was more than ready to move on. But the stunning 1948 Truman victory had put the House back into Democratic hands. Power for the Republicans was now only in the Senate. That's where Richard Nixon decided to go next. In 1950, he ran for the California Senate seat against Helen Gahagan Douglas, a liberal popular in the Hollywood community, and the wife of actor Melvin Douglas. Although there was mudslinging on both sides, the race against Helen Douglas has always been remembered for the vehemence of Nixon's attack. As he had in the Voorhees campaign, Nixon charged his new opponent was far too friendly to those sympathetic to the communists. In one speech, he said she was pink right down to her underwear. And in his famous pink sheet, he noted all the times she'd voted the same way as the far-left congressman Vito Marcantonio. To, to compare her to Marcantonio was a fraudulent tactic, but on paper it looked good. And uh, there's no question that the pink sheet was a very, very effective campaign tactic. The, at, at the time. The total effect of the pink sheet and the campaign and all that sort of thing was indeed to call Mrs. Douglas's patriotism uh, into at least uh, sort of a dubious, put it into a dubious light. His campaign style was slashing, burning, looting, raping, pillaging his opponents, his opponent's record, his opponent's character, his opponent's personality, his opponent in every way possible. And it worked. Richard Nixon beat Helen Douglas by a wide margin, but she had her revenge. During the campaign, she characterized him with a nickname. And it was one that would stay with him forever. Tricky Dick. 1952, and the first TV spots ever made were for Ike Eisenhower. For president, you like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, I believe in the future, of the United States of America. General Dwight Eisenhower was the larger-than-life hero of World War II. His next stop is Washington, D.C. He and the 39-year-old Richard Nixon barely knew each other when the young senator was selected as his running mate. Nixon was chosen not because Eisenhower thought he was the best man, but because he was a, the right balance for the ticket. And, uh, Eisenhower always had a certain uh, lofty distaste for some of the tactics that Nixon uh, uh, used. The first big test of their relationship came less than two months into the campaign when a front page story in the New York Post claimed Nixon had a secret $18,000 fund for personal expenses paid for by millionaire backers. There were calls for Ike to drop Nixon from the ticket. Pat Nixon urged her husband to fight. She said that, no, Dick, we know, both know what you have to do. You have to fight it through to the end. And my father told me years later that those were the words he really needed to hear then. You are about to hear a report from Senator Richard Nixon, nominee for the office of vice president. Of Though United Ike States. did not rush to Nixon's support, he did arrange for an unprecedented half hour of TV time in which Nixon could defend himself against the charges. Richard Nixon knew the speech could make or break him. He would have to sell the most valuable thing he owned, his reputation, to the American people. My fellow Americans, I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency. 
In the speech, Nixon laid bare his finances as he tried to show he had the same problems as every other American. We lived rather modestly. For four years, we lived in an apartment in Park Fairfax in Alexandria, Virginia. The rent was $80 a month. Throughout the speech, Pat sat by his side, and then he brought her into the drama. I should say this, that Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat, and I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. Towards the end of the speech was its most famous moment, reference to a gift to his daughter from a supporter. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep him. And then, perhaps in anger at Ike's less-than-unqualified support, he showed how tough a political fighter he could be. He went over Ike's head to save his career by asking for direct support from viewers. Wire and write the Republican National Committee whether you think I should stay on or whether I should get off. He double-crossed Ike. He put the decision in the hands of the people rather than in the president's hands. Telegrams of support poured in, but Pat Nixon never forgot the humiliation of the whole episode. My father had to lay bare their whole financial picture. All the, My mother's so private and so it was so painful to have everything that they owed listed, their life insurance, et cetera. It was a question of their inte integrity that she, she's never gotten over since. The Checker speech has remained central to the myth of Richard Nixon. He could be corny. The moment that uh, drove the elitists up the wall was the Checker speech, which was an extraordinarily effective speech. They had uh, this candidate for vice president, pulling out all the emotional stops right down to his dog, you know. It's okay if FDR uses Fala, but for Nixon to use checkers, uh, they recognize it as all too effective and cornball and uh, aimed at uh, uh, the lowest common denominator. I think it was a masterpiece. Uh, it's laughable now. People laugh about it. Oh, ho, ho, you know. But in fact, uh, he saved himself in the ticket, and I think it is not beyond consideration he may have saved the Eisenhower ticket. Eisenhower conducts a whirlwind speaking With tour Nixon the now Midwest. firmly in place, the campaign the continued on to November and an overwhelming ride. victory over Adlai Stevenson. Illinois falls to Ike, a sign of the end. It's Eisenhower by a landslide. Richard Nixon's relationship with Ike was now set. He'd play the politician to Eisenhower's statesman. And Eisenhower concerned himself, of course, with uh, great matters of policy, and he left uh, Nixon to these grubby little political things, and uh, Nixon uh, snapped that up. I think it was always in Eisenhower's power to cut Nixon off at the knees. Nixon knew that, and that's not the makings of a warm personal relationship when one guy's holding the hatchet and the other one knows it. Still, Richard Nixon suffered from the usual curse of near anonymity bestowed on all vice presidents. That changed dramatically in 1955 when Ike had a heart attack. A stunned nation hears that its president is stricken with a heart attack at the Denver home of his mother-in-law, Mrs. John Dowd. As an anxious nation awaits, newsmen converge on the press secretary for information. Suddenly, Richard Nixon was in charge of the nation. With his growing wariness toward the press, he was careful to avoid doing anything that would bring charges he was too eager to take over. In the meantime, the business of government will continue as usual. I think Nixon's performance was exemplary. He avoided any... Uh, appearance of usurping power, yet he did give the appearance of being there and, and being in charge. The president's car arrives for the meeting, and the president himself steps briskly out, showing few signs of the heart attack that kept him hospitalized for seven weeks. By the 1956 election, Ike had recovered, but there were Republicans worried about his health who were unhappy to see Nixon poised to become president. Once again, Ike was excruciatingly slow before he finally gave his okay to keeping Nixon on the ticket. The team won a massive victory in November. As returns rolled in on election night, the result was never in doubt. It was a landslide for the Eisenhower-Nixon ticket. Richard Nixon was now entering his second four years as vice president, 
but he still had to prove that he could head a presidential slate himself. For many voters, that began to change with a visit to Latin America. In 1958, pro-communist demonstrators attacked Richard and Pat Nixon's cars in Peru and Venezuela. Mr. and Mrs. Nixon are spat upon and reviled, while an inadequate police guard sits by, helplessly. The electrifying pictures showed a remarkably cool Richard Nixon at the eye of the hurricane. He was hailed back home as a hero. Then, a year later, in another triumph, Nixon was in Moscow at a trade fair. As the two countries vaunted the superiority of their systems, Richard Nixon's performance in a dialogue with the fiercely uninhibited Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev grabbed the attention of the world. Very early in the morning, went down to visit a market. Nixon was a man who knew when he was in trouble. And at the U.S. exhibition in Moscow, he had a brief debate on television with Nikita Khrushchev. And... Khrushchev wiped up the floor with him. He was aggressive and uh, pushy and belligerent almost. And Nixon was trying to be Mr. Nice Guy. Says Mr. Key, the Soviet will overtake America and then wave bye-bye. And Nixon came out of that first debate recognizing that he'd almost blown his career. And this was going to be the way uh, his confrontation with the communist leader would be reported and seen. William Sapphire was the press agent for a model American house at the exhibit. He guided Nixon and Khrushchev to its kitchen, where Nixon made a comeback in what's become known as the kitchen debate. And luckily, I, uh, I caught a picture of Nixon being assertive and uh, Khrushchev sort of standing back like this. Well... I haven't taken a picture since. I mean, that one made every front page all over the world. Richard Nixon had shown himself a formidable figure on the international stage. He would now try to show he was ready for the White House. President Eisenhower, who will be giving up the world's biggest job, poses with his vice president in Chicago. Richard Nixon, in 1960, was nearing the end of his eight years as vice president. They'd been prosperous and peaceful years for America, and there was good reason to believe the young 47-year-old could win the 1960 election. For eight years, he had been building a strong base among Republicans. But his rival was John F. Kennedy, whose claims of representing the future seemed the more plausible for his obvious youth and good looks. The two had long known each other, but Richard Nixon still resented Jack Kennedy's advantages. Of course, Dick Nixon resented Kennedy's wealth and position in life. Nixon had to go out and ask other people for their money in order to come up with the funds to run a campaign. Jack Kennedy could just write out a check. Who wouldn't resent such a situation? Which are made so eloquently. Their promises were not very different. To get America moving, build up the military, and resist communism abroad. If you believe that our ticket will keep the peace without... In his first bid at the presidency, Richard Nixon was going to leave nothing to chance. Uh, he wanted to get into logistics and what the bumper stickers said, what color the lapel pin should be, and all that kind of thing in those early campaigns. The candidates need no introduction. The but television was the big new player in the election scene, and the, and the broadcast debates were a key factor in the race. It is essential that a man who's president of this country certainly stand for every program that will mean for growth. And I stand for programs that will mean growth and progress. But it is also essential that he not allow a dollar spent that could be better spent by the people themselves. The consensus among viewers was that Richard Nixon lost the first debate because of how he looked. He was just recovering from an illness, and then, in his unfamiliarity with the new medium of television, declined makeup. The results were disastrous. Even his mother called from California after the debate to ask if he was all right. I was in the studio itself as the, as the pool reporter, and uh, it seemed to me that he really looked awful. He had some kind of a staph infection on his knee, which we didn't know about at that time. While Kennedy looked uh, sort of uh, debonair and confident. The press never found Richard Nixon as appealing as his rival, and he would never forget it. Uh, the press felt that um, a very close a kinship to Mr. Kennedy, the senator 
was very good at dealing with the press. He was very good socializing with them. Uh, I've never seen a more biased press, a more emotional press than in 1960. Uh, and I think that was more pro-Kennedy than it was anti-Nixon. As Senator Kennedy and his pretty wife arrived at the polling place early on election and day, the more Mr. Nixon saw it, the more antagonistic he became toward the press. On November 8th, 1960, John F. Kennedy beat Richard Nixon by one of the narrowest margins in history. Until the middle of the next day was the victory reclenched by one of the closest margins recorded, a plurality of barely over 300,000. Both men drove themselves to exhaustion in this campaign. And it, it, it ended up 50-50. It ended up the American people couldn't decide, is one way to look at it, uh, which of these hot-blooded, young, cold warriors they wanted to be their leader. The closeness of the vote made the widespread reports of voter fraud in Richard Daley's Chicago and Lyndon Johnson's Texas all the more galling to Richard Nixon. Some of his advisors pushed him to fight the results, but Nixon declined, feeling it would tear the country apart. A defeated Richard Nixon now returned to private law practice in California. For the first time in nearly 15 years, he would be out of politics. But less than a year and a half after his presidential loss, Nixon decided to run in the California governor's race of 1962. Pat fought him hard. She'd never loved politics and still dreamed of a quiet life with the family. She didn't want it. She didn't think he could win, and she thought it was too much, to, too hard on the family. He'd enough just been it. enough. He'd just been through this presidential campaign. It was only a year and a half later, and... Um, she didn't think it was the right decision then. Still, for Richard Nixon, it was painful to be away from politics and power, and he decided to make the race. Enthusiastic Nixonites are at hand and twisting at the Pomona, California County Fairgrounds early in the morning to welcome back to the site where he started his first political campaign, former Vice President Richard Nixon. It could hardly have turned out worse. The man and the race were mismatched from the start. Richard Nixon had dealt with world leaders on issues of war and peace. State issues couldn't possibly engage him. It was a nasty campaign, and he lost it. And in his final address, he seemed to boil over in fury at the years he'd felt unfairly treated by the press. It would be one of the most famous statements he would ever make. I leave you gentlemen now, <laughs> and uh, you will now write it, you will interpret it, that's your right. But as I leave you, uh, I want you to know just think how much you're going to be missing. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. The press and the pundits because immediately gentlemen. wrote Richard Nixon as political obituary. Everybody said, that's it, Nixon's done. What, I have said today what they didn't realize was that Nixon had just Thank you, changed American politics forever. It was a very calculated thing on Nixon's part, this last press conference. He knew that millions and millions of Republicans felt that the press was liberal, biased and always gave the shaft to Republican candidates and he said it to him and he took on the press directly unheard of in American politics the loss in California guaranteed that Richard Nixon would be out of public office for at least a while but he was never far from the political action he moved his family to New York to work in a high-profile law firm and he continued politicking at home and learning foreign policy abroad in other words he was preparing himself to be president. Everybody get off the middle of this LZ. Everybody move out. Get out there. 1968. If ever the nation seemed on the brink of destroying itself, this was the year. Vietnam. Protests against it. Black rage. Anarchy in the streets of Chicago. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy assassinated. The Democrats had been in power for seven years now, and to many Americans, a lot of what was going on was their fault. And to the head of the Republican challengers had risen Richard Nixon, out of office for those seven years, and now rested and ready. There was talk of a new Nixon, more seasoned and statesmanlike, with nothing of the old political street fighter. Brand new Nixon. There was some reason for it, too. And now I read about the new Nixon of 1968. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody that had his political pace lifted so many times can't be very new. In one way, at least, this was a new Nixon. He would run a race for president in 1968 far differently from the way he'd run the race of 1960. 
Nixon paced himself better in 68. Uh, he didn't try to be his own campaign manager. He took advantage in 68, as he had not in 60, of, of television. His television commercials in 1968 were probably the best ever used up to that time. I think he probably was the first president elected primarily because of television. In 68, he switched over completely to television, made at most one speech a day, but always provided that photo op for the camera to get on the evening news. The campaign was not about specifics. It was about a vision of an America light years from the one showing up each night on television. You know something? This is the first time in the history of this country that a presidential con candidate could honestly come before an American audience and say that respect for the United States around the world is in jeopardy. Nixon had a great sense of strategy. Uh, he knew where he wanted to position himself in the spectrum of issues. Uh, he had a he had a well articulated sense of what the people wanted to hear. I'm calling on behalf of Richard Nixon for president. By 1968, one hope was shared by all Americans that the war in Vietnam would end soon. Richard Nixon's ads plainly hinted that he was the man to do it. If after all of this time and all of this sacrifice and all of this support, there is still no end in sight, then I say the time has come for the American people to turn to new leadership, not tied to the policies and mistakes of the past. What he was implying in the 68 campaign, I've got a secret plan on how we're going to win this war. What he really had was a realization that this war has been lost. And he realized it at the same instant in time that Lyndon Johnson realized it. And that was in the Tet Offensive of 1968. Nixon's plan wasn't to win the war. Nixon's plan was to end the war by withdrawal and by building up the Arvin, what came to be called the Vietnamization program. Nixon will win the 26 electoral votes of Illinois. And it all worked. Win election to the presidency of the United States. Richard Nixon won narrowly. Nixon had counted all the beans. He, uh, he knew what he had to do in the electoral college, which states he had to win. And he sat in an easy chair and watched television, had his yellow pad, had his, had his um, totals on the yellow pad. Um, he was very taciturn, very, very undemonstrative. Finally, the results became clear late. And it was time for him then to go down and thank the troops with his family. It was as if you had flicked a switch. Uh, it was no longer uh, quiet, no longer contemplative. He went into this brightly lit ballroom, and it was smiles and his arm around his family, and the public, the public persona was advanced. <laughs> having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. But his failure to carry the House and Senate would make the efforts to implement his policies anything but fun. The President of the United States. A President of the United States. Life in the White House quickly fell into a routine dictated by Richard Nixon's very particular style of leadership. He intentionally created um, compartments in the White House. He would not confide everything to everybody. He had people pretty well figured out. Uh, he would treat me far differently than he treated Colson. Kissinger, he would play like a fine instrument, fine musical instrument. I recall when I first dealt with him, he was very formal, and it was almost as if we were on a set and we were playing president. He didn't seem to be very comfortable with people as a general rule, though. One remembers the famous picture of Nixon walking on the beach, you know, in California, wearing black shoes and black socks, and so we would, most of us would be out in a bathing suit. Uh, I think that Nixon was a kind of a a doer, somber figure, you know. He was a 
I think, a loner. That, that got to be a perceived problem. The image makers in the White House decided the president should have a friend. And so they researched it and discovered there was a man named Johnson who Nixon had lived next door to. So Bob Haldeman recruited him for the White House staff. And he was designated the president's friend. And Haldeman went in and said, good news, Mr. President. We have your friend here, Mr. Johnson. And Nixon said, Johnson? <laughs> he said, you remember? You used to live next door? And he said, oh, that fellow. He said, I never really cared for him. So he never saw him. As with any president, it was through the press that America came to know Richard Nixon. But his years away from power had hardly mellowed his feelings about them. By the time uh, Nixon came to the uh, White House in 1968, with rare exceptions, he regarded the press as, uh, as if not a monolithic enemy, uh, at least 95% uh, opposed to him. The press gave Richard Nixon very little credit for anything during the time he was president. And it was very frustrating. It was particularly true of the Washington press and the New York press. One great irony of the Nixon administration is that it's remembered as conservative domestically. The opposite was often true. He created the Environmental Protection Agency. He created the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Program. He was the first person to put teeth into affirmative action with the Philadelphia Plan. Um, he passed and put in place pension reform, all of ERISA. He changed the direction of Native American policy. He poured money into black colleges. He created the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. Uh, so he was a very activist Republican president. But there are a lot of things that happened under Nixon that people don't think of Nixon in association with. But they didn't happen in necessarily because Nixon wanted them to. They happened because of the reality of the American political system. The, the most striking example here is the imposition of wage and price controls. Very un-Republican, very un-Nixonian thing to do. But he did it. He did it to stave off Congress doing it in an even more drastic fashion than he did it in. He had no choice in the thing. Whatever his policies, whenever he had something to tell America, Richard Nixon always preferred to get his message out directly. The moon landing, a payoff from the Kennedy era, was one example. And Walter Cronkite's talking about the sea of tranquility. So I pick up the phone, and I call the White House, and say, uh, let me talk to the president. And I get through, and uh, I say, you're talking about the sea of tranquility. Why don't you use that in your statement when they call you, or when you talk to the astronauts, and use tranquility and apply it to your generation of peace? Good idea, he said. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. And then the phone rings. And it's Nixon to say, you know, that worked. And had we just done this and this, it would have been even better. The ongoing horror of Vietnam was inevitably the page one story of the early Nixon years. It was soon clear that the war was not going to end soon or easily with the new administration. As protests grew against its handling of the war, the White House attempted an end run around the stranglehold the anti-war voices held on the nightly news. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. The, um... I have initiated a plan of action effort of the silent majority was to um, gain support for the presidency despite the masses that you would see on television and read in the newspapers who would come in and really literally had the government under siege. A lot of things could have happened which didn't happen because people remained uh, calm and, and all the way through. But he had to have public support. This gave people an avenue to, to write wires or to write letters or to come out vocally. It was the incursion of American troops into Cambodia in April of 1970, presented not as an escalation, but as yet another way to shorten the war, that really revived the protests. We were going in and getting out. And, uh, uh, and it might have worked, even in terms of public opinion. 
had it not been for Kent State. Remember that picture of that woman rising and, and, and screaming? Uh, that, made, uh, that made it look as, uh, as if uh, Nixon had turned against the young people in the country. Well, of course he had not. But even as the war dragged on, there were other happier moments back home. One of his daughters, Julie, had married Dwight Eisenhower's grandson, David, just before the inauguration. That marriage of two dynasties had been nearly 20 years in the making. As Richard Nixon approached the end of his first term, he would undertake startling initiatives that would change the world and bring him briefly to the highest point of his long career, even as darker events would begin to lead to the end of his presidency. happiest days of his presidency, Richard Nixon saw his daughter Tricia marry Edward Cox on the White House lawn on June 12th of 1971. The next day, the wedding was front page news, and so was the publication of the Pentagon Papers, government documents detailing the history of the American involvement in Vietnam in past administrations. The president was not particularly alarmed. His national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, was appalled. The first reaction was, this can't hurt us because everything in the Pentagon Papers has to do with what happened before us. But then Kissinger said, but wait a minute. Uh, we're engaged in some rather delicate negotiations. And if it turns out that delicate diplomatic negotiations become public knowledge, it's going to hurt our ability to conduct our negotiations. Richard Nixon's Justice Department attempted to get an injunction against the publication of any more of the papers in the New York Times, and in addition, the president responded with orders to stop any and all leaks cold. A White House special counsel, Charles Colson, was made head of a group called the Plumbers because stopping leaks would be their main task. After you'd worked for Nixon for a while, you realized that he said things he didn't mean. So we sort of built in a delayed reaction to the most extreme things that he ordered us to do to make sure that he really wanted to do them and, and give him a chance to get off the hook. When Chuck Colson came along, he didn't operate that way. If Richard Nixon said, go blow up the Capitol, Colson would salute and run right out and buy a load of dynamite. There probably were days when I panted to Nixon's dark side. Um, there may have been days I would like to think when I inspired his noble side. Uh, did he have a dark side? Of course. Uh, so do you, so do I. The first enemy Richard Nixon had taken on was the anti-war movement, which he felt was hamstringing his conduct of the Vietnam War. Nixon used the apparatus, as we now know, of the government to discredit, uh, follow, use all of the intelligence gathering techniques against this anti-war movement. The embodiment of it was Daniel Ellsberg, who provided the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and the Washington Post. As it would later be revealed, the plumbers broke into the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist to find damaging evidence against him. Meanwhile, the White House anger at the press just kept growing. Nixon felt that the press was on the side of the anti-Vietnam people, so they started tapping the telephones of reporters, absolutely uh, outrageous. Can you imagine that coming out today? But things were still relatively under control. That would end before long. One afternoon, a man who had been assigned to my staff came eye wide into my office and said, John, Chuck Colson wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. And I said, you've got to be kidding. And I said, what for? He said, well, there's some documents that they think are connected with the Pentagon Papers and they want me to go in there, firebomb the place, and then make a burglary. I said, that's crazy. He said, I know it's crazy. But even as the administration was going after its enemies, it was achieving its greatest successes. First, there was the remarkable visit to China, a nation Nixon had long painted as America's implacable foe. In February of 1972, Richard Nixon met with, drank with, and dined with the leaders of the world's most populous communist nation. He would later regard the trip as the high point of his presidency, and it was met with near universal acclaim. <laughs> 
Then, in May of 1972, Richard Nixon went to the Soviet Union and signed a Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, a first big step toward taming the arms race between the superpowers. It was part of a policy to warm relations with a land Nixon had always seen as profoundly evil. And with detente, a backing away from Cold War brinksmanship, the whole world breathed easier. In his policy toward the Soviets and China, Nixon gained two ends. On its own, the policy advanced Richard Nixon's goal of world peace, but it was also geopolitics at its most sophisticated. Fearful of each other, both Russia and China were more than ready to make America an ally. I think that the opening of China and the establishment of detente with the Soviet Union was, first of all, an act of political courage on Nixon's part. It was very high-risk politics, and it was the product of very hard thinking on Nixon's part about the shape of the world and the shape of the United States and where we are in the world and what we need to do and what kind of world do we want five and 10 and 20 years from now. It was Richard Nixon's past that made it all possible. Only Nixon could have led to the relationship with China. That's because he was one of those who uh, complained bitterly about who lost China. And he had the uh, uh, strong anti-communist uh, reputation. So he was able to bring his constituency, which trusted him as they would nobody else on the subject of China. You know, if Nixon says it's all right on this one, you know, it's got to be all right. But as in so much of Richard Nixon's career, success was shadowed by failure, high purpose by low politics. On the very night he was toasting Leonid Brezhnev 5,000 miles away, a small group of operatives were breaking into the Democratic headquarters in Washington. They'd get away with it this time, but a month later, it would be different. The Democratic National Committee is trying to solve a spy mystery. It began before dawn Saturday when five intruders were captured by police inside the offices of the committee in Washington. The five men carried cameras and apparently had planted electronic bugs. One of them had several crisp new $100 bills in his pocket. The Democrats say they have no idea who would want to spy on them. June 17, 1972, the event that would begin what would forever after be known as Watergate, took place when five men were arrested after breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate office complex. It wasn't long before the connection to at least somebody in the White House staff became apparent. One of the things they seized when they arrested him was a telephone book which had the White House uh, number and Chuck Colson's extension. I mean, that took 24 hours. It went to the White House overnight. I willingly got involved in the cover-up. and. As the weeks went by, I soon became, in essence, the desk officer of the cover-up. I was the man in the middle. I was, you know, going over to the re-election committee and finding out what they were doing and coming back and telling my superiors at the White House what they were doing and trying to make sure that nothing fell apart before the election. Mr. Nixon, did you know about the burglary of our Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate? Did you know, Mr. Nixon? But in the early days, the possibility that the president would one day be implicated in the affair was unimaginable. Neither the president, obviously, or anybody in the White House, or anybody in authority in any of the committees working for the re-election of the president have any responsibility for it, and therefore there's no reason why it should be a matter of concern to the American public, and it certainly won't hurt for the president's re-election. <laughs> As the 1972 election neared, Richard Nixon seemed to have it in a lock. Most Americans believed he was doing all he could to end the war in Vietnam as quickly and as responsibly as possible. The signing of the SALT agreement with the Soviets, detente, and the spectacular mission to China had won him enormous support, including grudging applause from his harshest critics. If Richard Nixon ran a subdued campaign in 1968, 1972 campaign, he was virtually invisible. His plan was to emerge from the White House only in the closing weeks. As it happened, the victory over liberal Senator George McGovern was nothing less than mammoth. It was unprecedented. Richard Nixon carried every single state in the Union save Massachusetts. But if he was overjoyed at his re-election, he didn't show it. Nixon had the problem of being a sore winner. He, uh, he had a lot to do in 1973. He won in a landslide, and now he was going to make some real changes. The Haldeman sent a bulletin around asking everybody for their resignation from the White House staff. As he wanted to 
clean house, but it wasn't done very beautifully. It was done rather harshly. Throughout the first administration, the terrible story of Vietnam had continued. Hundreds of thousands of American troops had been withdrawn, but thousands of Americans continued to die there. At last, after so many false starts, the peace process succeeded. On January 27th of 1973, a ceasefire was signed at the peace talks in Paris. One of America's saddest episodes was over, and Richard Nixon's earlier pledge to end it had finally been redeemed. It is necessary to recognize is that he got us out of Vietnam, which was something that his predecessors hadn't been able to do, and he got us out without setting off something akin to a civil war here in the United States. That is to say, Nixon had a lot of pressures on him. The anti-war movement may have been capturing the television camera's attention, but there were an awful lot of people in this country who wanted victory in Vietnam. I think the worst thing you can say against Richard Nixon is that Almost half of the names on the Vietnam War are the names of young men who died when he was the commander-in-chief after he decided this war is unwinnable. It was the longest and costliest retreat in our history. Watergate is defined, I noticed, in the dictionaries now as abuse of high office occurring during the presidency of Richard Nixon. Watergate may be in the dictionary today, but the story was still a minor one when Richard Nixon's second term began in 1973. Stunning successes in China and the Soviet Union and the impending end of Vietnam had given Richard Nixon a landslide victory and pointed to a glorious second term. As we meet here today, we stand on the threshold of a new era of peace in the world. But even in his triumphant moment, Richard Nixon's presidency had been fatally compromised. And within 18 months, revelations of extensive illegal activities, including obstruction of justice, perjury, and the payment of hush money, would bring down a president for the first time in history. I condemn any attempts to cover up in this case, no matter who is involved. There was a cover up from day one. Now, what I don't think anyone really ever did and sat around and planned was how to obstruct justice. That never happened. Uh, what happened is everybody just sort of slid into this terrible quagmire because of the problems that Liddy and his men had created. Just before the inauguration, the Watergate burglars had appeared in federal court before a man who had proved to be one of the president's most dogged opponents, Judge John Sirica. Two weeks after the inauguration, the Watergate story began to gain momentum. The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate alleged political espionage in last year's election campaign. That includes the Watergate bugging case. The committee will be headed by North Carolina Democrat Sam Irvin. On March 21st, 1973, John Dean warned the president the cover-up was getting out of hand. It would take a lot of money to keep the Watergate burglars quiet. I tried to convince the president, as, as the tapes show, I told him at one point, you know, there's a cancer growing on the presidency and if he, I, I assumed that he would take the scalpel out quickly and cut it off and he didn't uh, to the contrary people say geez if he had just come out and said and I'm gonna punish the guys who did it and we're gonna clean up the sh operation around here if he had done that it, the press and Judd Sirica would have wanted to know what else have you guys been up to and what else have they been up to? They'd broken into Dr. Fielding's office out in California to try to get some goods on Daniel Ellsberg. They had, what else have they been up to? They had been bugging foreign embassies. What else have they been up to? They had been bugging American newspaper reporters. What else have they been up to? They had been running these dirty trick operations. In other words, to admit that those were my guys and they did it and, and I'm the responsible party opened Nixon to all of the crimes that had been taking place in his first administration. The president now believes through a subsequent investigation that his previous Watergate investigation conducted by John Dean was full of holes. John Dean began to feel he was being set up to take the fall. His lawyers began meeting with federal prosecutors to secure the best deal if and when he went public with what he knew. 
Jeb Stuart Magruder, the deputy head of President Nixon's 1972 re-election committee, also met with prosecutors and told them about the meeting the previous June when the Watergate break-in was planned. Sources say that Magruder has told federal investigators that he attended a meeting in the office of then Attorney General John Mitchell in February of last year where he says the Watergate break-in was plotted by Mitchell, G. Gordon Liddy, and John Dean III, personal counselor to President Nixon. Every day, the trail drew nearer to the White House. The plan kept evolving as the problems evolved. There was no one person who was going to take the rap. There were several people. You know, initially it was thought, well, you know, we'll stop it at Liddy, then we'll stop it at Magruder, then we'll stop it at Mitchell, then as it started coming over to the White House, then we'll stop it at Dean, and then the president decided I'll stop it at Haldeman and Ehrlichman. It finally got to the point where uh, Bill Rogers and Kissinger and one or two others advised Nixon strongly that we were liabilities, we were getting beat up in the press every day, these accusations were hanging over our heads, and so he decided to fire us. The president was becoming ever more isolated as his closest aides moved from the White House to the committee rooms and the courtrooms. John W. Dean III went before the Senate Watergate Committee today and, as expected, gave the committee names, dates, and places involved in the Watergate affair and its cover-up. Included among those names of, of the names of those having knowledge of the cover-up was Dean's former boss, the President of the United States. The story had the town by the throat. It, uh... When, they, when it got to the Irvin hearings, you could, you could leave your office and take a cab to the Senate or the House, and you wouldn't miss a word. I mean, it was on uh, radios all down the corridor as you, or television, as you left your own building. It was on radio in the uh, cabs, and it was on uh, in the open doors of the Senate uh, office buildings. And, uh, you know, on the desks of the guards, it was everywhere. July 16th, the unbelievable revelation at the Senate hearings, everything the president and anyone else had said in the Oval Office had been taped secretly by the president himself. There was now a new issue at the center of the Watergate story. Would the president release the tapes? He refused, claiming executive privilege. This is a rather remarkable letter about the tapes. If you notice, the president says he's heard the tapes, or some of them, and they sustain his position. But he says he's not going to let anybody else hear them for fear they might draw a different conclusion. This principle of confidentiality of presidential conversations is at stake in the question of these tapes. I must and I shall oppose any efforts to destroy this principle, which is so vital to the conduct of this great office. Archibald Cox, the Watergate special prosecutor, had refused to accept merely a synopsis of the tapes. On Saturday, October 20th, the president ordered his attorney general, Elliot Richardson, to fire Cox. Richardson refused and resigned. President Nixon had to reach down to the number three man in the Justice Department, the Solicitor General, Robert Bork, before finding someone willing to obey his order to fire Archibald Cox. In the wake of what became known as the Saturday Night Massacre, the president's impeachment was no longer unimaginable. Stunned by the fury of the public's response, the White House agreed on October 30th to turn over the subpoenaed tapes to Judge John Sirica, but two of them were missing. On November 21st, another startling revelation. On the day the prosecution suspects the Watergate cover-up began, the crucial conversations between the president and his chief aides are missing or partially obliterated. Those tapes which do remain were finally put in the custody of the court this afternoon a month after the White House first agreed to honor the subpoena. For the president, the news just kept getting worse. By an overwhelming vote of 410 to 4, the House of Representatives today gave its Judiciary Committee unqualified powers for an investigation to determine if there are sufficient grounds to impeach President Nixon. On April 30th, 1974, the president made public transcripts of some of the tapes, which he had edited heavily. They were an instant bestseller, and to many readers, they showed a man capable of more mean-spiritedness, pettiness, and even bigotry than they assumed could ever inhabit the keeper of the Oval Office. And the passages he'd excised, and his frequent use of the words expletive deleted, only fired any reader's imagination not to his advantage. I think the, uh, the tapes give you a, uh, instead of a truthful impression of Nixon, a warped one because he was not the same person to uh, Chuck Colson, uh, 
as he was to Arthur Byrne. Uh, he wasn't the same to Pat Buchanan as he was to me. Now, perhaps this is a, def uh, a fault. Uh, at the same time, it's a, uh, a complexity. As spring turned to summer and the legal wrangling continued, two trips now brought back images of the foreign policy president, even if they didn't succeed in pushing Watergate off the front page. In Egypt, the president's meeting with President Anwar Sadat was a step towards the Camp David Accords with Israel five years later. A summit in Moscow in early July was less successful. The meeting with Leonid Brezhnev reinforced detente, but failed to achieve a new arms agreement. Back home, the Watergate endgame was beginning. The Supreme Court rules unanimously that President Nixon must turn over subpoenaed material to Watergate prosecutor Jaworski. In San Clemente, President Nixon is preparing his response to the court's order. And one of the new tapes became known as the smoking gun because it showed how soon after the Watergate break-in arrests in 1972, the president was directing the cover-up in spite of the urging of some of his aides. I told Richard Nixon, look, find out whoever was involved in this thing, expose him and cut your losses and get out of it. Little did I know at that point that he really thought Mitchell was involved and he wasn't about to turn on Mitchell. So the ultimate drama of Watergate and the great national tragedy turned on something as simple and human as Richard Nixon not wanting to turn one of his friends in. Too loyal to Mitchell, he let Mitchell go. He let them all go. They all went to prison. And as the boat sank, he threw them out one at a time. To argue that Dick Nixon went down because he was too loyal is just ridiculous. Ehrlichman goes, Haldeman goes, Dean goes, Mitchell goes, everybody but Dick goes. And then he's out there in that boat all by himself. There's a storm coming at him, and he's trying to figure out what his options are. The thing that's so appalling to me is that the president, when this whole idea was suggested to him, didn't in righteous indignation rise up and say, get out of here, you're in the office of the President of the United States. How can you talk about blackmail and bribery and keeping witnesses silent? Aye. 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 On July 27th, the House Judiciary Committee approved the first article of impeachment. Within three days, it had approved two more. Aye. No. 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 Mr. Rodino. Aye. Before impeachment proceedings moved to the full House, the president made a final inevitable decision. Richard Nixon had been trying to extinguish the growing flames of Watergate since before his second term had begun. Now in early August of 1974, a year and a half later, the struggle was nearly over. Richard Nixon understood that he did not have the support in Congress to stop the impeachment process from grinding onwards. He knew he would have to go, and now he began to make his goodbyes. His family argued with him, urging him to fight, but he held firm. Still, the master politician, he knew the numbers and the political mood were against him. The family spent a final evening together in the White House on August 7th. My father had called White House photographer Ollie Atkins up to the solarium where we just finished supper because he wanted a picture for history's sake. And we all linked arms and stood there and smiled, but my mother just hates that picture because she said there our hearts were breaking and were smiling. Thursday, August 8th, was spent making final arrangements. And then, at 9.01 p.m., Richard Nixon made his last speech as President of the United States. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as President, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. I was in the prison, and I was watching his resignation on a little black and white television set, feeling, first of all, a tremendous sadness for him, personally. Um, I liked Richard Nixon. I admired Richard Nixon. I respected Richard Nixon, and he was my friend. And I saw uh, the country that I loved and had served as a Marine Corps captain, and four years in the White House, uh, torn apart. So it was a very dismal moment. And I was looking at a possible three years in prison. So it was not one of the happier days of my life. 
Charles Colson would end up serving seven months. John Ehrlichman would serve 18 months. Bob Haldeman would serve 18 months. John Mitchell would serve 19 months. And John Dean would serve five months. On the day of the resignation, Friday, August 9th, Richard Nixon made his farewell to the White House staff. The farewell speech to the staff, it was, um, it was very difficult because he was really letting down his guard for one of the few times in public. I mean, just from not only the cosmetic point of wearing the glasses, but his voice cracking with emotion as he spoke about a man is not defeated until he gives up. You have to keep going in life, keep fighting. And it was difficult. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility, and with very much gratefulness in our hearts. Then his final goodbye. It's how many will always remember him. Who knows what to say about Nixon and those Last moment, I did. I mean, what the hell was going on there? He's given the V for victory, and he's hunched over, and he's so quintessentially Nixon, and he's got that phony smile on his face. And who knows what to make about that? And it takes Shakespeare to describe this kind of a scene. It's beyond my powers as a writer. At Andrews Air Force Base, he and Pat would transfer to Air Force One for the journey home to California, to the house by the Pacific at San Clemente. Then, in a surprise announcement, just one month after the resignation, Gerald Ford had a pardon to Richard Nixon. A full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon. It was a bitter pill for many Americans, and there were immediate charges that a deal had been struck. Resignation in return for a pardon. It wasn't true, but many would say it's what cost Gerald Ford the election two years later. Now, life in the beautiful San Clemente house, in a spectacular setting, still with a staff of 22, settled into a period of surreal calm. By all accounts, in the first months after the resignation, Richard Nixon remained in a deep despair. Friends had never seen him so depressed. Then, slowly, as he devoted himself to his memoirs, his mood lifted. This was the kind of situation that had always suited him best, fighting his way back from defeat. By the 1980s, Richard and Pat Nixon were again living in the East, near the centers of power, and their grandchildren. And Richard Nixon was determined to stay the insider. By the time the 80s rolled around, I, uh, I would call him and arrange to go up once a year and do what he called a tour d'horizon. And you would sit down with him and say, he would say, what do you want to talk about? And I'd say, I want to talk about uh, the political scene, I want to talk about China, I want to talk about the Soviet Union, and the Super Bowl. And, all right, he said four items, you know, he would mentally uh, give them a certain amount of time. I had two hours uh, with him, and uh, he would then do it, and I'd be taking notes like mad. Then he would pick my brain about what's happening in Washington for about a half hour, 45 minutes. So, and that's what he did, I think, with a lot of people. In return for his briefing, you know, he would expect the inside stuff from you. Slowly, as the years passed, his reputation would be transformed. He would write extensively on world affairs and revisit the scenes of his greatest successes, China and Russia, where he was received still as a man of greatness. Once the failed ex-president, he became the sage of foreign affairs. Even the White House he'd been forced to give up welcomed him back. Richard Nixon was nearly 80 now, the elder statesman enjoying his grand return to center stage. In the early 1990s, Richard Nixon was living in busy retirement in suburban New Jersey. He continued his role of public figure, traveling and writing. Then in June of 1993, Pat, his wife of 53 years, died of lung cancer. The funeral was held at the Richard Nixon Library and birthplace in Yorba Linda, California, just 30 miles from where the two had first met and dated in 1938. For the next 10 months, Richard Nixon kept up a full schedule, including a final trip to the Russia that so fascinated him in March of 1994. Then, one month later, 
On April 22, 1994, Richard Nixon died at a hospital in New York of complications from a severe stroke at the age of 81. The funeral in Yorba Linda was attended by all the living presidents. More than 42,000 others came to pay tribute as well. There was an affirmation at the funeral that he'd made it back and everybody who had worked with him uh, felt that they had worked for somebody for a reason. Uh, the Nixon administration, with all its mistakes, did some wonderful things, started some wonderful things. And Nixon as a man, I think, uh, redeemed himself at the end. I think every American over 30 years old is astonished at this outpouring of affection and emotion for Richard Nixon. And thinking back to the summer of 1974, no one could have predicted it except one person. And I think he saw it. I think that he landed in California after the resignation and he devoted himself to this moment, to making this moment happen. And he's done it. He, he became not just an elder statesman. To, to everyone's amazement except his, he's our beloved elder statesman. Richard Nixon was buried next to Pat beside his boyhood home at the library and birthplace, back where he began. His life had spanned and helped define the America of the 20th century. Born before World War I, he grew up in the Depression and arrived on the national scene at World War II's end. He shaped American politics for the next 30 years, a figure larger than life, but more obviously human than any other politician of his time. For those 30 years, no one was indifferent on the subject of Richard Nixon. His name elicited instant passion. If this has softened, now that it's been 20 years since he left the White House, the question of who Richard Nixon was only seems to sharpen. Uh, there was a man of very, very high intellect, big format, you might say. And that was one Nixon. And then there was a Nixon, the little schemer, the little person who would break in on people and try to get things on people and destroy people and all the rest of it. And those two coexisted within one person. And he'll be remembered as one who could have been, could have been, one of our great presidents, except he did himself in. He was a portrait in progress, always. And I've used the uh, metaphor of the seven-layer cake. If you want to see Nixon, you see uh, a kind man to do business with and work with. Now, that was one layer. Then he could be mean and petty uh, and ruthless. That was another layer. Then he could be the long-headed statesman and see uh, noble goals. So that was a good, another layer. Uh, then there was a layer that you heard on the tapes, uh, mean-spirited Nixon. And there are a couple of more layers that I never even ran into. So if you're going to Take a piece of Nixon. It's not fair to work along one layer. You just got to take your fork and go right down that whole cake and take the bitter with the sweet.